Welcome to another episode of Celebrating Act Two, where John Coleman and I have a wonderful guest uh, that we're going to speak to today. Uh, you haven't met before, but really going to enjoy. He is a wonderful guest and, and a fascinating man who spent his career in film music and, and teaching and other uh, wonderful pursuits uh, in the music world. But he's, uh, he's one of us, Art. He's a, an elder statesman. He's a, he's a baby boomer. And uh, unlike a lot of us baby boomers, he's, uh, he's finally gotten around to writing the book, his memoirs. Now, it's not just about him. It's about the famous composers that he worked with over the years. And uh, it's, it's going to be, when it comes out, it's going to be a really fascinating book. But let's meet our, our, uh, our special guest, Daniel. Daniel Robbins. Come in, Daniel. Hello, oh, there he is. Hi, hi, John. John, our hi. Great, thanks for joining great, us. Great, great to see you. Great to talk to you. Uh, Daniel, am I correct that um, you spent your whole life in music and mostly music for films, feature films? Yes, yes, you could say that. I I started um, at age, probably it would have been age ten, with piano lessons from uh, in a Catholic school, after school, from a nun who was really sweet and nice and too nice and wouldn't make me practice. <laughs> and then I <clears throat> was what I call a no-practice kid. Uh, that was only for about six months. And then my mother uh, said, that's it. You know, we tried it. It didn't work. So then, oddly enough, just uh, that summer, just a couple months later, I saw the film that inspired me to go into music, um, the 1959 Charlton Heston version of Ben-Hur. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and uh, that really was quite overwhelming. Three and a half hours of music uh, for such a one of the great films and one of the great film scores. But then um, that's when I really started seriously. That's when I, I changed totally. And I actually asked for piano lessons. And then one thing led to another. The film music was always there as an inspiration, but my teachers, at that time, film music was looked at a little bit differently back then. Um, uh, how really so? Europe, well, European trained teachers uh, tended to almost look down their nose as film music, American film music, especially as being a type of commercialism. Oh, Which really? really is, in a sense, of the word it is, but maybe all music is when you think about publishing and, and performances and whatnot. But uh, so I, my, I had two teachers. I had a piano teacher and a composition teacher. Uh, the, the piano teacher was a wonderful teacher named Florence Sook in Long Beach, California. And my composition teacher was uh, a composer, Morris Ruger. And uh, the two of them knew one another, and I didn't know till way later on. They used to scheme on my my lessons. You know, they used to compare notes, <laughs> and they used to say, you know, what do you have him on now in theory? Oh, good, I don't have to do that. What do you have him on now on piano? Well, don't you think it's time for the Bach conventions? Don't you think? I didn't know any of this till <laughs> I was an adult, and I I knew them differently as adults. But it was very interesting because. It was an interesting dichotomy because Mr. Ruger used to try to steer me away from film music, and Mrs. Zook understood that it was my inspiration, but she made it clear. She said, you know, you really do have to study. You can't sit down and, instead of practicing, you can't sit down and improvise on your favorite film scores. She says, you know, you're never going to learn, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened was Mr. Ruger had known the composer of Van Hur, Miklas Rocha, he had known him in Los Angeles. And ironically enough, Mr. Ruger wrote me a letter of introduction. And that's how I first met uh, Mr. Rocha. Um, later, way later on, when I was an adult and I could really talk to Mr. Ruger as an adult, I told him, I said, you know, it's funny that you always kind of didn't like the film music inspiration on me, the influence, but I said, but Miklas Roja's music is a lot like yours. <laughs> Only you've written a lot of operas. Roja's written a lot of film scores. And I said, you both represent the same bloodline. 
because I studied with both by that time. So uh, it's interesting uh, phenomenon. But um, and then R Mr. Ruger, before he passed away, one of his last conversations with me, as he told me, to uh, that I found uh, the influence uh, that uh, was beneficial to me music wise being Miklas Roja. And he said, stay with Miklas Roja, study with him and stay with him. And uh, it's a, quite a turnaround. But yeah. then when I was studying- no, the, I, I, wanna, I wanna interrupt for just a second mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because I wanna put the music into perspective. Mm -hmm. We're about the same age. Yes. And I remember as a kid Mm -hmm. uh, all these, what they, what they, I think they called them sword and sandal uh, yes. Yes. Uh, movies, you know, they're sure. king of, king of sure. kings, Ben-Hur. Yes. yes. Um, they were yes. very, very popular at the time. Mm -hmm. And this is the, this is post-World War II, really the, the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember as a kid going, you know, to, to all of these movies and the yes. music was very powerful. Most yes. of us uh, didn't, Think about the music. We, we right. you know, it's it's there. It's right. powerful. You know, you you can hear the drums as the Roman soldiers right. come into the right. plaza. But mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know about music. And even mm -hmm. today, sure. at the Academy Awards, most people don't sure. pay attention sure. to the composers and the yes. best song yes. and that kind of stuff. It's really a, a very subtle yes. uh, art form. Uh -huh. uh, but boy, at that time, mm -hmm. the music was very classical. Yes, forgive me yes. if I've got the, the term yes, wrong, but yes, right. compare it to the music of films today. I know that stuff was big orchestras. Yes. Um, yes. Wonderful, full, rich sounds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and Miklos Roja, if I'm mm -hmm. pronouncing the, the name. Yes. Right, yes, that's right. Right. Um, he like was Jaja. one of those famous composers. Again, not to most people, not a name most people would recognize, right, but right, he was right. uh, in the film world. He was a famous composer, right. did a whole bunch of stuff. Yes. Um, other names that come to mind are Alfred E. Newman, Elmer Bernstein, Elmer Bernstein. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, you also studied with Henry Mancini, who, uh, who was mm -hmm. kind of a comparatively a pop mm -hmm. Yes. His oh, yes. music was more yes. pop yes. Than, yes. than classical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, right. What's what's the uh, right. the right. famous Mancini theme that uh, mm -hmm. he did? Did him? Did him? The Pink Panther. The yeah. Pink Panther yeah. theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Panther. Mm -hmm. And he also didn't didn't Mancini also do? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what's the detective theme? Yeah, Peter Gunn. Peter Gunn, famous Peter Gunn. jazz. That's what started him. Yes, famous jazz yes. piece. So yes. what what I'm getting at is that right. you studied really classical music. Yes, yes. With right. guys who were who were doing music for film. Yes, yes. And and tell me what happened yes. as you grew up how you went into the business. That that's yes. that's yes. What, I understand Rocha was a, a very mm -hmm. big influence cuz you worked mm -hmm. with him a, yes. a, a lot. Yes. Yes. But what was your first business experience as a professional composer, orchestrator? Yes, it, musician? It, uh, it was very interesting. It was um, during the 90s, Roja became ill. He had increasing um, um, uh, health problems. And up to that time, I had been a student of his and a friend. But um, in the 90s, he was separated somewhat from a lot of people because of his uh, his health situation. And I saw a picture at the Hollywood Bowl Museum. Um, in this, this was in the early 90s, and it was the conductor at that time, John Macheri, who was a friend of Roja's also. And it was a picture of Roja uh, in a wheelchair. I think it had rehearsal the Hollywood Bowl Symphony. In uh, Roja, the inscription on the bottom of the photograph at the museum said that Roja had just said to John Macheri, quote unquote, I think the industry has forgotten about me by now. And John Macheri said, oh, well, your fans have not forgotten about you or your music. That really moved me because I, I had not seen Roja probably for about five years because of his unavailability. So I... I knew that a producer 
than a journalist. He was a famous Hollywood uh, film music journalist named Tony Thomas. I knew he was Roja's best friend at the time and that he used to screen Roja's mail for him and used to take care of his business affairs. So I thought, you know, if I write to Tony Thomas and tell him that I've studied with Roja and everything, maybe I could get access to him again. And uh, what I will do is um, uh, I, I know Tony Thomas will read the letter to Roja because he read his mail to him at that time. Ah. So in a sense, killed two birds with one stone. So that's how I reconnected with Roja. And then it was for good. Now, he used to visit, uh, the name of my book, by the way, is Wednesdays with Roja. Yeah. And um, yeah. um, Tony used to visit Roja on Wednesdays. Uh, so uh, when the camaraderie was so great with the three of us, the first week that I joined them, they gave me permanent membership. So from then on, for the rest of Roja's days, <laughs> we've all three of us visited his uh, him at his house every Wednesday, and that's how my work started. Because yeah. so I, I, have a time, I have a question for you because um, uh, there, uh, there's no John and I have discussed this already. There's no doubt that uh, mm -hmm. as the book comes closer to be released, yes. we're going to have you back uh, to oh, yes. concentrate yes. on that. But um, yeah. our real interest right now is the fact that. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you're a baby boomer. You've been, you've yes. been a baby boomer for a while. Mm -hmm. You're not new mm -hmm. at being a baby boomer, and yes. uh, you are you are writing the book. But you right. have a fascinating career, and I'd like to to uh, if you could quickly give us a review of yes. the kind of yes. things you've done from your teaching, your orchestration, uh, maybe arranging yes. and composing. Uh, give us yes. a, a if you could a, a a view of the things you've done that have gotten you to this point. Right. Yes. Well, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the first um, job that I had with the uh, orchestration and the reconstruction of these film scores, and by the way, reconstruction as opposed to orchestration is the fact that when uh, my job is a, um, some people would call it orchestrator of these film scores, but I call it reconstruction because I was putting back the orchestration that was originally uh, outlined by the composer himself, by Roja and some other film composers. So I call myself a reconstructionist, but for all intents and purposes, you could say orchestrator, I guess. But, but anyway, the first job came when the Entrada CDs uh, were going to do the um, complete recording of Roja's score from Ivanhoe. 1955, I think it was film, and they were going to re-record all of the all of the music. That's what they do nowadays, by the way. They record the they re-record the entire score, not just highlights, the way they used to on so-called soundtrack albums. But I mean, every fanfare, every uh, loop piece, dinner music, uh, it's all re-recorded. It has to be reconstructed. So that was my first. And the reason I got that was because uh, the producer of uh, the executive producer uh, for Entrada CDs knew Tony Thomas. So he called Tony Thomas. He says, we need somebody to put this Roja score back together. Do you know who can do it? And there I was at what they say, the right place, the right time with the right qualifications. Sure. <laughs> well, you had you had studied with Roja. You had worked with yes. him. Um, and, and you were, by this time, no spring chicken. You were a, a, an yes. adult. Right. Uh, teaching music. Right. right. And uh, of course, you, you were the yes. perfect choice. And that, well, that led to more, yes, more that's albums right. of that's film right. scores. That's what happened. Uh, yeah. They did a series of them. They did Ivanhoe and then they did uh, Julius Caesar, yeah. the one that was uh, the mid 50s, uh, starring, starring Marlon Brando and those wonderful Shakespearean actors like James Mason. Yeah. We, we so it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but. It, it, here it is in the 90s or, mm -hmm. or later mm -hmm. and they're recording or recreating and yes. re-recording re-recording the the film score from movies from the 1950s yes yes and there, there's a market for that now you wouldn't say it would be the so-called top 40s market but there was a market <laughs> there's a whole core of people like us you know that absolutely yeah. worship the films as well as the film music and yes, you're right. I mean, that's what happened. One project led to another, and I did orchestra scores. And then I really liked the fact that they started asking me to do other things, uh, other composers, uh, in addition to Roja. Uh, yeah. I did a three 
movement suite from Alfred Newman's uh, films, uh, three films. Um, and uh, I did some piano transcriptions where I transcribed the scores off the film scores and transcribed them to piano and performed them myself, performed and recorded them myself. Oh, really? And that it's got, yes, film music for piano, uh, volume one and two. And I, and I might say that all of these CDs were very successful. Um, you know, they, they, uh, I, I've never done things like this before, you know, really. And yeah. I didn't know anything from a business standpoint. And Tony was the expert, Tony Thomas. I have a question for you. I have a question for you, mm -hmm. question for you uh, Daniel. Uh, so, uh, okay. uh, which is near and dear to my heart because I, I served uh, yeah. uh, in an earlier life, I served on uh, several uh, public school boards. And so, right. you're teaching. Uh, first yes. of all, you have a, a graduate. You did graduate and and postgraduate work at at uh, no less than uh, USC and yes. UCLA. Yes. So, I mean, you yes. you've been in the world of of movies. But can you tell us a little yes. about your teaching experience and the kind yes. of students that you had? Yeah, I've done all types of teaching as far as college as well. Private too. I used to teach piano and composition and theory. Uh, my one of my favorite periods of time was in Long Beach when I lived in Long Beach. And I, let's see, I worked as an accompanist in the music department at Long Beach City College. And then what happened was the music majors discovered how hard the theory classes were. And uh, they, uh, they knew my background. And I had studied privately with Morris Ruger, who was on the faculty at, U at Long Beach City College, who was giving the students such difficult assignments. So the students caught on really quickly to come to me for private lessons. And I had a core of students, I'm telling you, they were all from the department. I knew them all. One of the teachers even told the class, I wasn't there, but one of the students told me, he said, uh, I want this assignment to be done the best way that you can do it on your own. Don't go to the Harvard Dictionary and don't go to Dan Robbins. <laughs> so, but, you but were their then, secret weapon. Yeah. And, but the um, but I got to know the material, you know, so well, you know, I, um, by that time. And then what happened is I got my first teaching jobs at uh, I think I got my first teaching job at Long Beach City College. So I started teaching the impossible music theory classes myself. And then I went to other junior colleges uh, on the piano and faculty. Um, they, at that time, I wasn't teaching anything that had to do with film music, but when it started lapsing over, as far as my teaching, when it started lapsing over back into film music is when I had, I think it was at Golden West College and um, in Huntington Beach, California, and another one I taught at the same time, uh, Cypress College in Cypress, California. And okay. they started giving me classes that would seem less likely to me. For instance, they said, uh, we really need somebody to teach a songwriting class, commercial songwriting. And I said, I don't think I'm your person. You know, I, you know, I, I'm not an expert in that field of commercial songwriting uh, from a pop standpoint. And they said, look, 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 we need somebody. You were in recording studios, weren't you, with those uh, soundtrack CDs? I said, yes. I said, you're, hi you're hired. You're the one. <laughs> That's commercial. <laughs> we'll expect you there eight o'clock. So anyway, what happened is I developed my own way of teaching some of the commercial material. I used to draw a lot on Henry Mancini because he's done so many things that were in the uh, commercial uh, yes. quote unquote yeah. pop line, jazz line and everything. And I liked his music. I could identify with it. So therefore I could teach something I believed in. And uh, then what happened was I invented my own film music class. I thought since these colleges are open to so-called commercial music, I invented my own film music class and I taught, I've taught that course now, it's my own course. I've taught it at Golden West College, Cyprus. Um, the other one was the one in Orange, um, uh, Chapman, Chapman University in their, in their cinema department. And so now my teaching was kind of going back into my film music. And also, I really like teaching music appreciation also, because that kind of went with yeah. sharing my favorite music with the students is really what it's all about. And okay, so if I could, I'd like to fast forward to your 70s. Uh, you've mm -hmm. had a brilliant career. Yes. And um, 
then all of a sudden, what's a nice boy like you writing a book? And yes. In the seventies, you're you're another one of your act twos. Can you tell right. us a little bit about that as a tease yes. uh, for yes. the, the, the next episode we do? How'd that yeah, happen? That, well, the idea started uh, really really early on. Um, it was back in the seventies, and I I ran into a book written by a female, kind of modernistic uh, composer named Dika Newland, and. Um, she had studied with a composer, a very um, different kind of composer than the Hollywood studio composers. His name was Arnold Schoenberg, and uh, he was a, a very important figure in, in cla contemporary classical music um, in the 20th century. And she had the honor of studying with him at UCLA. And she, in the foreword of her book, she said that her mother at the time told her that you should really keep a journal because you're you really being connected with Mr. Schoenberg, you really have a lot of important things happening to you right now, and you should really notate them all into some some kind of journal. So then, when I reconnected with Roja and I was getting these uh, these reconstruction orchestration assignments and going to recording sessions in Europe to record them, which is another story for another interview. Um, I felt the same way, and I thought, you know what I, I'll do? I'll get like a, I think I was keeping a diary, something at that time anyway. And so what I did is anything that applied to Rojo or my so-called career with this film music um, uh, uh, activity, uh, I wrote in red. And I thought at some later date, you know, this may be really uh, important. You know, I might be like writing something about this period of my life and it'll be easy access to just extract all the paragraphs that were in red well that's exactly what happened ultimately and um, that's how i could remember some details and um then what happened about the book uh proper is uh when i really got the idea to really write a book and this this would have been gosh a number of years ago i think it was like the late 90s anyway i I didn't know where to start. You know, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know where to start. I didn't know anything about publishers. I didn't, you know. So I called Nicholas Roche's son and I told him what I was planning on doing. And he said, um, you should write the book. He said, you shouldn't really even think about publishers at this point. He said, the important thing is to write it. And then I, uh, I talked to another friend who had several things published in um, journal, uh, in uh, uh, magazine format, um, articles for magazines on similar topics. And I asked him, his name was uh, Alan Hammer, uh, uh, Les Hammer, I'm sorry, Les Hammer. He's written a lot of um, nostalgic articles for different journals and whatnot. And I asked him the same question. I said, what, what do you suggest about publishing? I don't really know how to begin. I don't know. And he said the same thing that Roja's son said. He said, uh, write it first, he said, but he added a little important addendum. He said, what you should do is you should write your chapters of your book like uh, articles and then try to get them published as articles in a journal first. And he said, then when it's all together and you have all of these, all of these articles that, that were published, um, you could go to a publisher and you could say that the material has already been published. Do you want it as a book? So that now you're not a new kid on the block. You know? So I did that. Uh, I started, that was in the late 90s, and that's how my book started. And I, uh, I found a, a really amenable um, film music journal called Film Score Monthly. I knew the, the managing editor somewhat. Well, let's say he knew my work. He knew my CDs and whatnot. So he was very nice, and he said, whatever you write, we'll publish. Just send it. So... Um, I, uh, all through the years, that's what I did. I, I, I wrote uh, the article uh, in no particular order. I just wrote the subject matter as it came up in, uh, in, uh, in my mind. And then uh, now for the book, now when I really am submitting it to, for publication, I've reordered chapters and expanded on chapters. So it's, it's not just only a collection of articles. So it hangs together as a book, but that's really the genesis of the book. Really. So it, it, if you forgive me for drawing, mm -hmm. drawing a comparison <laughs> to some of those 
old classic films uh, like yes. uh, Ben Hur. Yes. But it was years in the making. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's Tens very true. Thousands years that's, in the making. That's so, very true. Yes. This is fascinating because you had a wonderful career, but you kept notes. Mm -hmm. And as you interacted with uh, these famous composers, including uh, Miklos Rocha, mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying very hard to get his name correct. Oh, it's uh, he always says um, it's Hungarian, and Zsa Zsa Gabor was Hungarian, and he said it's all it's pronounced like Zsa Zsa because it's oh. a Z S A. Ja so, oh, okay. so if you forget, you can think of her. <laughs> <laughs> we can't forget her. Right. Um, so here you are, and uh, years later, and you're finally coming around to what is, as I understand it, is really your memoirs. I mean, it's yes. it's about yes. Rosia, but yes, it's your memoirs. Uh, your so this is almost a biography for you, an autobiography mm -hmm. as well as a biography. For... You know something. You know something, John. Let me t permit me to say something very, very, um, very specific about that. You know something. What you're saying is very interesting because when I first started the book, I think I was doing it all wrong. Uh, I started the book, like you're saying, I started the book like my memoirs. Okay. Well, the problem was it was too much my memoirs for the audience that I was aiming for because I all of a sudden realized my mistake. I thought, you know what I'm doing? I'm writing a lot of details about myself, you know, and I thought, but the readers of this book, uh, at least this particular book, uh, are going to be reading it because of Roja. You know, there's a lot of books like this. I've read a lot of books myself about composers where their apprentices uh, and students, top students and friends and everything, um, have written about the composer. And it, uh, they're, well, like uh, Deacon Newland's book, that's exactly what that was, Schoenberg Remembered. And everything in her book applied to Schoenberg. Now, it applied to her, too, because it was Schoenberg from her perspective. So it had to be from her perspective, of course. But it was everything was about Schoenberg. And that's why I read the book, because I didn't know who at that time. I didn't know who Deacon Newland was. And I was interested in reading about Schoenberg. And um, I thought, this is the same situation. They're, they're not going to be reading it about Daniel Robbins, at least not at this point. Maybe someday, centuries from now, maybe <laughs> I'll be <laughs> revered enough to be, uh, you know, for people to, for, to be the other way around, where somebody's writing about me and people want to read about me. But I thought, but there, it'll be hopefully interesting to them. But it'll be interesting from the main standpoint is about Roja that that's the audience that will be interested in a book like this. So I started all over. I had written two chapters already, and I thought, no, it's too much me. It's too much details about me that don't apply to Roger. Yeah, but I, I'm going to interrupt you here for a moment because uh, we were uh, uh, fortunate enough to have you give us uh, some samples of what are in the chapters. And yes. in fact, even though it is yes. about Roger, uh, right. the truth of the matter is, is that because you met him at such a young age, Right. And he so influenced your work yes. that yes. enough of you still comes through there right. that that's what began to make it super fascinating for John and I to want to speak right. to you because oh, you're good. a fascinating guy. And so it happens that uh, you, because you were so influenced by this uh, uh, amazing uh, composer, that mm -hmm. the lives are sort of in, uh, intertwined. He basically yeah. gave you purpose That's of your right. life. So uh, we're looking That's forward right. to uh, when the book comes out perhaps next year, yeah. right. whenever right. it does, and to speak to you again in, in more detail. Right. But it's a, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a wonderful story about a relationship that you have had with him over the years. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah. highlighting his work, but it's just a wonderful story. And we congratulate you for Thank you. Thank you. in your 70s, publishing a book. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yes, thank you. It's, it's about time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's 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 really interesting. I, I um, no, I know what you mean, Art, what you're saying, because on the other hand, um, I realized, too, I thought, you know, this book has to be about my uh, about me to an extent, because then it it would have no meaning as far as my relation, as far as the subject matter of the book, the subject matter of the book is my 
uh, my interaction with Nicholas Rocher professionally and personally. So, um, but, uh, but it's very interesting, you know, when I, I kept the, the notes, um, when I went back and looked at them, we can talk more about the contents of the book later, but it was very interesting that there was some very funny quips that I wouldn't have remembered. Um, um, one, I just give one example. It, it was what, one of the first times I did the Wednesdays with Rocher and I brought along a recording I can't remember what it was now. It was one of my own pieces. I think it was um, a cello sonata that I had just written. And um, I, I brought the recording along and I was playing it for Nicholas Rocha and Tony. And Tony Thomas, in my diary that night, written in red, I said something like, Tony Thomas was interesting in that he seemed to pay no attention to the music at hand and didn't seem to have much of an interest. And as soon as I started playing the recording, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but it was, I had written something like this. He went in the other room in Roche's music room and started fooling around with CDs and pulling music off the shelf and apparently showed no interest in the, in the music. But I said that in actuality, I, pretty soon it came out that Tony uh, was very interested. I guess what happened is when he started hearing my music, he knew he had someone here who he could put to work, you know, professionally. And uh, he was, but that's just his personality. His personality, I guess, was that he could listen to it and go through CD uh, collections in the next room, you know, whatever occurred to him or anything. Yeah. But I, I said in the book, you know, that turned out Tony was very interested, you know, and uh but anyway he was the one who started putting me to work he started the one to be asking me about projects he'd say and, uh, and if yeah. i might say you're still at work today you're still teaching yes. you're in demand as a lecturer yes and yes. Uh, i would assume when the book comes out you'll be in demand uh, as on a, speaker. a, book, on a book tour i hope so you know what you're saying is very interesting because just a, on last palm sunday uh there was a church up the street from where I live, um, La Cañada Presbyterian Church, and I didn't know anything about them or anything. And then it was just an accident. Uh, someone said in an email um, something about, um, they're doing King of Kings, I assume that's yours. And I thought, mine? And I thought, I, I, King of Kings, I, I put together a, uh, what you call a choral suite of King of Kings, right? right after Rosia passed away. It was a commission from his son. And uh, it's a 20 minute long highlights of the music score. And my my instructions were to make it exactly, the parts that I use make exactly like it was in the film and don't change it for album purposes or anything like that. So it's like a cantata. It has choir and or, choir parts that were in the score, orchestra parts, choir and orchestra together. But I didn't know anything about this performance and uh, I didn't know anything about that church and they come to find out, yeah, that's what it was it, because my, my King of Kings suite has been published. I've been, I think by Shermer music and it's rentable and that's what they were doing. And uh, when I contacted the conductor, he said, um, very nice man, Jack Lance. And he said, I heard that you live up here. He said, that was my next thing was to track you down. And I said, well, I tracked you down. And then he says, I want you to come to the dress rehearsal. And he says, also, I was going to give a pre-concert lecture about the music on Palm Sunday, you know, before the lecture, before the service started. And he said, but now that I know you, I want you to do the lecture. So that's my most recent lecture. Tell me well, da Daniel, Daniel, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, that's another perfect example of why we were pleased to track you down <laughs> and to have this conversation with you. And yes. we are looking forward to speaking to you again sure. when your yes. uh, uh, one of your new act twos is, will yes. be Wednesdays yes. with Soja. And yes. uh, thank you very much for the time you spent with us today. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Art and John, it's a, re a really pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you for your interest, too, because it's always uh, to find the camaraderie. Uh, of this generation, of, which you can mention something like Ben-Hur and the person you're talking to doesn't say, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> but thank you for your time. Interesting. 
For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.